of old.
online. It is a beautiful Sunday to be together as we continue to await the arrival of the Christ child on Christmas Day. Friends, you will see in the pews we have some connect cards. We would love to know that you are here. You can fill one of those out and put it in the offering plate. That'd be great. You can also just scan the QR code on the back of the bulletin and fill it out virtually. If you're worshiping with us online, you can find the connect card on the front page of our website. We have a lovely worship service in store for you today, so now let us continue to worship. Here now our Old Testament lesson in Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 10. A shoot shall come out from the stock of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with e equity for the meat of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fat one together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the ask, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the ash dead. They will not hurt or destroy on, on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nation shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. This is the word of God for the people of God. What are you afraid of? When this question was asked, we got responses such as spiders, sickness, birds. Mass shootings, clouds, not being there for my children, COVID. Today we light the candle of peace because we so desperately need God's peace in the midst of all we fear. May this light be a reminder that Christ is coming, God was with generations before, God is with us today, God will be with us tomorrow. Even now, God is on the way. Amen. David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. 
and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow, overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Our children would like to come up.
We've now come to our time of prayer this morning. I please invite you to note that there are a list of prayer concerns in the bulletin. I hope you'll um, take note of those and take those home with you and then spend time praying for those um, who are listed as you see your prayers this week. Um, please feel free to let us know if you have any prayer concerns. You'll see some prayer request cards and a few racks that you can fill out and drop in the offering plate when you come to a little bit. Um, also, you can go online and you can see your prayer request on our website. Um, we want to be prayer for you and for those people and situations that are in your lives. I know you may have concerns that you'd like to lift up this morning, so I now invite you to lift up any concerns you have, and then after each petition, we can say together. God, we take a deep breath in and know that you are here. For two or more are gathered, you are there. You never leave our sides. Like a protective mother hen or the sun who circles the earth, you carry us with you. So today we bow our heads with tender spirits and ask that once more you would lean in close. Hear our prayers, void our hearts. Send your spirit rushing through us like a mighty wind. For these days, God, we have much to fear. We fear the rising tide of violence. We fear global warming. We fear the return of a COVID variant that could once again shut down the world. We look at our own lives and are afraid that we aren't making much of a difference. We fear being sick, watching our parents age, cancer, being alone, we fear for our children and grandchildren. We fear rejection. We fear grief. We fear not being enough. Holy God, the work in our lives is deep. At times it feels like we're swimming in it. And so we come to you today because you are God who said, Do not fear. Do not be afraid. 365 times in Scripture, once for every day. You are a God who has inserted yourselves into the corners of our lives, refusing to let us go, refusing to leave us alone. And so we rest in that, and we empty our pockets of our fears and give them to you, trusting that you will hold them tenderly, just as you hold us. You whisper, be not afraid. You promise to never leave our side. You call us beloved. May that be enough for today. And now, with hope in our hearts, we pray the words your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation. I now invite you to stand as you're able and turn to page 196 and the hymnal. Let's sing together. Come, the long expected Jesus.
these common phobias are, you know, fear of closed in plates or heights, highway driving, flying insects, snakes, needles, right? All of those are pretty irrational fears we have. And you can develop an irrational fear of virtually anything. And for me, well, for me, I have what is called ornithophobia. Does anybody know what that is? Birds. Fear of birds. That's right. It doesn't make any sense. Logically, I know that a bird is not going to attack me. It might. So we have to be careful. I will do just about anything I can to, you know, avoid being around birds. It's okay if they're flying in the sky or, you know, away. But as soon as they get close, you know, I'm, I'm not happy or hawks. Now there are a lot of hawks in these neighborhoods, and they are everywhere. Sometimes they're on my back patio. I have to grab my child to make sure it does not, you know, carry her away. <laughs> There's a lot of them. But I'm not sure how this phobia kind of came up. I think it was a series of many different events. But there are some things that have solidified it for me. One is um, a couple years ago, my husband, Chris, and I had the opportunity to travel to Costa Rica on a mission trip. And while we were there, we visited an animal preserve. Now, they had an aviary there, and of course, I'm like, I'm not going in there. But they also had two cans in the aviary that they would put on your arm. And apparently, my husband loves fruit loops or something, but he wanted a toucan more than anything else that day. And he needed me to go in and take the picture. So I agreed, because of the love of my spouse, to quickly take a picture and then run out of the aviary. And so we got in. I was being hyper vigilant to all of the birds that were flying around. They put a toucan on Chris's arm. He was in heaven. And then the other two can dive bombed my head <laughs> over and over again. In which case, I am screaming. My camera was long gone. This is laughing. It's amazing we are still married. And I ran out of that aviary. Y'all, it was the worst. Stay away from birds. You don't know what they're going to do to you. Anyway, I understand that it is an irrational fear. For the most part, birds don't attack me, but that doesn't stop me from being afraid of them. Now, fear, as we all know, is as common a human thing as anything. Whether those fears are rational or not, it's a feeling that we all experience from a very young age. I mean, I think about the young child who suddenly gets panicky and afraid because they lost sight of their mother while they're just walking around the neighborhood. You can see the fear in their eyes. And as we grow, you know, we start to be afraid of more things like spiders or monsters under the bed or scary movies. One of, or my favorite is that there are more people afraid of public speaking, what I'm doing right now, than are afraid of dying. Which means that at a funeral, most people would prefer to be in the coffin than giving the eulogy because that's where they rank on their fears. But the list of fears goes on and on until we get to those things that really strike fear into us that is so deep that it can leave us paralyzed. The fear of getting sick. The very real fear of a mass shooting. The fear of losing our loved ones. The fear of leaving our loved ones behind. Fear of having our failures exposed. We are afraid of so much. Now, as you probably saw on your bulletin cover for today, I asked various groups this week the question of what they were afraid of in order to get the word cloud that we see. Um, you can see some of the different um, fears that folks have in fingers. It's on there, don't worry. But I was a little bit shocked because last week I did the same thing. I asked several groups what, their, what gives them hope as we were lighting the candle of hope. And I got some very good responses. 
responses for that. But then this week, I posted this question on Facebook. It was every single minute, y'all. I got an answer. One fear after another. Which tells me that we have many more things that we are afraid of than things that we are hopeful about. What does that say about our culture and our world right now? And so in the midst of all of these fears, all of these anxieties that overwhelm us, we seek out peace. The second Sunday of Advent is all about peace. We just lit our peace candle this morning. And our Old Testament passage that you heard read is commonly referred to as the peaceable kingdom. In this passage, the stump of Jesse alludes to the Davidic dynasty believed to bring about God's goodness throughout all of the generations. And then it's followed by this vision that Isaiah has where God's spirit will intervene leading to a world of righteousness and a world of peace. And in this peaceable kingdom, it portrays unlimited inbreaking of the kingdom of God and harmony between animals, harmony between humans. These are clearly images that reflect the expansive hope for justice and good order and the well-being of the weakest and most vulnerable members of our society. It says that children will no longer be hurt. Those vulnerable ones will be protected. Transformations, reversals will abound. On that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a signpost for all people. All the nations will seek him out and his dwelling place will be glorious. The evils of war and violence and oppression will be stomped out. And those whose lives are threatened by a lack of faith on a daily basis, will instead find love, and peace, and harmony. The poor will be lifted as God's righteousness abolishes poverty and all the hungry will be fed. God's kingdom on that day will be a land full of wisdom and understanding. This peaceable kingdom is God's eternal dwelling place. And according to Isaiah, it will be more than just peaceful. It will be glorious. <laughs> But there are a couple of differences culturally there. 
Betrothals, as opposed to engagements, were legal and binding. And they were usually arranged between families when women were quite young, when many were still very young girls. So Mary is possibly only 14, maybe 15 years old when this angel comes to visit her. And I don't know about you, but being a teenager in any time period now or 2,000 years ago is not an easy thing. There are so many pictures just figuring out who you are. And then on top of that, she's betrothed to Joseph, but not yet married. And since betrothal is a legal binding contract, any sort of infidelity would be a breaking of that contract. So this pregnancy not only puts her future marriage in jeopardy, but also her status in society. If Joseph decides to dissolve the betrothal contract, which he had every right to do since she was pregnant, it was highly unlikely that another man would ever marry Mary. And in that society, for women, marriage meant survival. And really, an infidelity like this, as it looked, could also result in Mary's death in that society. That was a lot to be afraid of on top of just the fact that she was about to have a baby. And yet the angel tells her, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Friends, we hear this refrain all throughout the Christmas story, and in fact, it is one of the most common phrases in all of Scripture. It is said in some way in the Bible 365 times. That means that there is a do not be afraid passage for every single day of the year. Shouldn't seem too surprising, right? With all of the fears that we have. Now, after Mary's initial skepticism about what sort of message she was receiving, the angel says, do not be afraid, and shares the message of what will come and explains how it will occur, responding to Mary's question. He even points out that her cousin Elizabeth is an example to prove it, that nothing is impossible for God. And it's at this point, after the angel has explained everything that Mary says, let it be. Now, something that I think here that is important to notice here is that, first of all, Mary is given a choice in all of this. She assumably could have said no to the angel. So often, so often when we hear this passage and when we think of Mary, we think of a woman who is blindly obedient, one who had no say in her future, who couldn't have voiced her opinion anyway, but that's not actually what we see in this passage. In this story, Mary is neither spineless nor is she mindlessly obedient. She is not forced to bear Jesus. She ponders. She questions the angel. She wonders how this could be. And in the end, despite her fears, she says yes to God. Not because she has to, but because she wants to. And in the process, she doesn't lose herself, but becomes more herself. Mary doesn't know all that's going to happen in her future. She, of course, still has fears and questions, but she trusts God enough to say yes to this first step. Mary is a model of discipleship. Because like Mary, we too can follow Jesus, follow God's calling, while still having fears and still having questions. And I think that this is the real beauty in this story. God chose Mary, not because she was powerful or prestigious, not because she was fearless, not because she was blindly obedient. In her book, Amy Jo Levine says that Luke does not record what prompts the favor for God on Mary. There is no indication that Mary got divine notice because she helped her mother with the laundry, because she did well with school, or because she had a beautiful singing voice. It doesn't say that God gave her favor because she was pretty or prayed a lot or even because she was a virgin. Rather, God chooses Mary because she has nothing. She is a young girl in a 
a society that values men in maturity, Mary is lowly and poor. But even in her fear, she understands something that she is trying to then tell us. That God chose her because God chooses those who are willing to have even in the midst of their fears. God chooses Mary because her real miracle of faith isn't being fearless, but it's about being faithful even in the midst of her fear. Because God is bringing about hope and peace in the midst of fear and darkness. You see, from generation to generation, God shows up in the midst of our fears and our uncertainty and our confusion. From generation to generation, faithful people have said yes, despite their apprehension. From generation to generation, our ancestors in faith have accepted the invitation from God. The prophecy in Isaiah paints a vision of what the world could look like when we say yes. Because when we say yes, righteousness and equity reign. When we say yes, the wolf lives with the lamb. When we say yes, no harm or hurt shall destroy the earth. When we say yes, a child shall lead the way. When we say yes, we make a difference in the world. This is the vision that has been passed down to us here and now in this place. And we must pursue it to make it real. So does all of this mean that when you leave here today that you're not going to have any sort of fears anymore? That you're just going to have a sunshiny disposition all the time and, you know, be as brave and courageous as ever. We got a couple head nods, so excellent. But please, that's not what that means. On the second Sunday of Advent, on the Sunday of peace, as we are looking at Mary, in the midst of our fears, I wonder how God might be calling you. I wonder what ways God is waiting for you to say yes despite the fears that you might have. Because if the story of Mary tells us anything, it's that even in the midst of our fears, God can and will use us. Because you see, God uses us whenever we step up for our neighbor. God uses us whenever we are kind to someone on the street. God uses us when we take that extra minute to help someone who is in distress. God uses us when we donate money to the Wellworth and Stewart Center Christmas Project. God uses us when we volunteer to be with the kids upstairs or the youth on Sunday nights or any other way in this building. God uses us when we hear God's call and we say this, even if we might be a little bit afraid. God is with us as we live into God's kingdom. And so friends, today I want to encourage all of you to stand with Mary. Think about those fears that are arising in you and how you're being called to serve despite them. And stand with Mary, even if your voice cracks. I encourage you to say, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your will. Friends, this morning, one way that we say yes to God is through our giving, through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Um, every week, I try to highlight some of the amazing events that are happening here at St. Paul, and we have a bunch of them um, in this season. But one that I do want to point out, um, and you may not be quite aware of, is that every year St. Paul hosts the St. Paul Basketball League, um, we opened our registration for it in October. That league will start in January. And friends, we have 320 kids signed up for basketball this year. This is a way that St. Paul pours into the lives of our children, pours into the lives of our community. It's a way that, y'all, I'm not sure how we're going to get that many kids in the gym, but we will figure it out. So we might have those fears, but God is with us. And said yes. So we ask that you would be in prayer for them, and this morning as I invite our ushers to come forward,
host a program like this, that we're able to be there for our community and their needs. Amen.
friends, fear can be a good thing. It can help us be attentive while we're driving down the highway. It can alert us to possible accidents. It can motivate us to do our best. However, fear can also be harmful. For so many of us, fear of the other, fear of failure, or fear of the unknown has led us to make sinful choices in our lives. Choices such as building or tearing others down. And so today, in confession, we ask for mercy and pray for guidance. As we confess, we come before an entirely merciful and loving God who says to us, do not be afraid. Let us pray the prayer of confession printed in your answer. Patient God, you know just how often we make decisions from a place of fear rather than love. You know just how often we allow fear to take the place of logic, fanning unhealthy fires in our lives. You know just how often we tell your words, do not be afraid, on dusty shelves and in the back of closets. Family of faith, even when we forget God's words, God does not forget us. Even when we lose our way, God does not lose us. Even when we fall short or make mistakes, God forgives and holds them to us. We are known, forgiven, and loved. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now if you will join us in the faith we sing for the Son of Thank you.
you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of
May we have the simple faith of Mary and always do your will. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to offer ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It's the most wonderful time of year. So... But uh, 
it's a, uh, you know, we, the last several years we finished uh, in the black um, at the end of the year. This year we're a little bit behind in terms of uh, expenditures of giving, but hopefully we can make that up. So if you think about St. Paul as you're uh, winding up the year, um, any, uh, any gifts that you uh, make between now and the end of the year will be much appreciated. Thanks.